Hey, hey, everybody, welcome on into the ClayShare studio. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and this is ClayShare Live. Tonight, we have Michael Harbridge from Learn Fired Arts joining us as our special guest. And he's going to do a really great tutorial on making clay bird houses with these fabulous gourd molds. So if you haven't checked those out yet, you need to go over to learnfiredarts.com and check them out. Um, he has a couple different sizes and different sets, and he's going to show you how to use them. I've got a few announcements before we get to Michael. We're coming up on the end of the month, and you know all this month during November, we have had the applications open to our ClayShare Veteran and Veteran Caregiver Scholarship. That is a lifetime premium membership to ClayShare for a veteran or a veteran caregiver. So if you yourself are a veteran or the caregiver of a veteran or you know of someone you'd like to nominate, please go to ClayshareResources.com and fill out that application on your behalf or on their behalf before the month is out. We'll be announcing the recipients of the veterans and the Veteran Caregiver Scholarship in December, I believe on the 14th. So don't let this opportunity pass you by. We do this every year. So if you do happen to miss it, you got another chance next year and the year after and so on. But I would hate for anybody to miss out on this year's chance to get in on that application. Um, other really exciting stuff we got going on here on ClayShare, it's our, our annual member sale that we do, our membership sale, I should say, where we have 25% off your first three months of premium membership with ClayShare. So just go to ClayShare.com or download the ClayShare app and use the code SAVE25 to save 25% off your first three months of membership. That's new members only. So that's for new members. Um, all right, and then in prime time tonight, we're gonna be making a little tutorial after Michael does his, and that's for the premium members. We're gonna do this lovely little chicken vase where we're gonna layer stamps over texture. And also, we're doing two giveaways tonight. Michael's donating a $100 gift certificate to Learn Fired Arts, and that is open to the public. So one of you lucky folks is gonna win that. That's watching right now. And then in prime time at 6.15, I'm gonna be giving away as our ClayShare member appreciation gift, one of the mini rollers that we have. So the winner gets to pick which one they get. And we're gonna give one away every week until Christmas. So lots of fun stuff. All right, I, I did the business stuff. Now let's go over to Michael. <laughs> hey Michael, thanks for being patient and waiting. How are you doing? Oh, glad, glad to be here, Jessica. And I, I think what you guys do with the scholarship for the veterans and stuff is wonderful. I mean, you've got a great group and I hope everybody takes advantage of the special and and joins the prime group because it's it's well worth every penny that you spend on it. Well, thank you. We love having you as part of our Clay Share family too. And we always love having you join us. I'm only sad this is the last broadcast you're gonna be with us for this year, but we got Clay Share Con coming February, so. That's right, it'll give <laughs> right. me time to come up with some new to ideas. Prepare. And I, so, yep. I know. All right, so tell us all about tonight's Gord Bird House tutorial. So tonight we're going to be working with the gourd clay puzzling molds, as Jessica had mentioned, and I'm going to show you a couple different techniques. This one is using the bark texture and the leaf forms. And so I'm going to show you guys how to incorporate both of those into your puzzling methods. And then we'll, we'll talk about the leaves and, and things. I'm going to talk to you about um, covers on the bottom that are removable and ways to make the birdhouse so that you can clean them out each season. Um, and different tips and tricks with that. And then the other one that I'm gonna show is using the daisy rolling pin, which Jessica is gonna be using tonight with the, the prime group as well. And so it's kind of the same technique, but rather than the bark texture, we're using the daisy rolling pin on the pieces. And then I've got actually leaf forms for daisy leaves, which I thought were ideal for the top of this one as well. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do those. And so we're going to be working with the forms and there's four different size forms. I know some of you are going to be jumping on before we're even done tonight and placing your order. So we do have a special on the assortment of all four sizes. You can buy them individually and you can buy a set of just the, the two taller neck ones. Um, I also posted on my Facebook page just a little while ago pictures of other things done with those molds like the turkeys and the owls and just plain gourds. So there's there's lots of uses and I always try to come up with different things that you can do with the forms that are outside of what obviously the shape is. So I'm gonna flip the camera down and I'm gonna grab one of the molds here. We're gonna work tonight with um, the two shapes that I didn't use. And so we're gonna work with the smaller narrow neck one to do one of them and then the shorter rounder one for the other. 
And I'm gonna set that one aside. We're gonna start with this one. And if you're not familiar with the clay puzzling molds, there are two piece molds. There's a Velcro strap that holds them together. And they're two parts. And these are made with earthenware bisques. So they will absorb the moisture of the clay. I always get the question, and I just emailed somebody back right before the live today. Um, I always get the question of, can these be used for slip casting? And they are not designed for slip casting. These are ceramic bisque. They're not plaster of Paris. So they're more durable. Originally, when we started doing this, we were working with plaster. And they were just so fragile um, that it, it was a challenge to... Um, to, to get them to stay together and not get broken in workshops. So I've got a bunch of pieces of clay sitting off to the side here that I've taken and just ripped and kind of flattened to um, a, just under probably a half an inch thick. And they can be different shapes, different sizes. You don't have to do perfectly round pieces of clay. You don't have to do perfect shapes. They're just torn and I just kind of press them between my fingers. Um, we want this to kind of look rustic. And um, if you're not familiar with the formal leaf forms, they are rubber leaf forms. And we bought this company earlier this year and there's lots of different designs and shapes and sizes. And so I've got a variety of some of the smaller leaves here that I'm going to work with. On this bigger gourd, I use some of the bigger ones like the dogwood and the, the dahlia leaves and the Wisconsin maple and the traditional maple leaf. And on the back here, I've got the oak leaf. And so this one being a bigger gourd, I use some of the bigger leaves. But I know a lot of times you guys are working with schools, you're doing workshops, you need something really affordable. So right now we've got a lot of these small leaves on our website, learnfiredarts.com. They're like half off. When we bought the company, Somebody had gone crazy making um, rose leaves. We had thousands of packages of these when we bought the company. And so these are just kind of a nice, I mean, they are from real rose leaves, the molds are made, but these just kind of look like a traditional leaf. And so these would be ideal for spring bird houses, for fall bird houses, because your coloring on it can be done with fall colors, greens, yellows different combinations. So these are all like half off on, on these, the geraniums, the pansies. Um, these are the small pansies. So because I'm working with smaller molds, I'm gonna grab some of these smaller leaves to work with. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take and work with a piece of clay that's a little bit bigger than the leaf that you're working with. Press that leaf into the clay so that it's kind of flush. And then you're gonna go on to the bark texture pad. Now, um, earlier today, I was getting everything ready for this. And normally with this technique, I work on the small bark texture pad because I can just press these small pieces. But um, today I was working with some of the bigger leaves and those bigger leaves go beyond the bark texture pad. And so the larger bark texture pad um, if you're going to be working with larger leaves, you're probably going to want the larger bark texture pad. And it was kind of funny because I didn't have one of these down in my studio. We've sold so many of these and we've had a hard time keeping up on them. And I went to pull everything out about an hour ago and I'm making sure I have everything. And I realized I didn't have a large one. And so I had to quick cast one, get it in the oven, get it baked, get it cooled, get it trimmed. And I was seriously trimming this like five minutes ago before we went live. So um, but you're going to take then, and the side that the leaf is on, you're going to press that against the bark texture pad, and you're going to press all over it and work that clay down into that bark texture. So when I lift that up, the leaf is embedded in the clay, but now I've got that bark texture, and I'm going to lay those facing down inside the mold. I'm not going to press real hard because I don't want to lose that texture, but you're going to do the pieces that are going to have leaves in them first, and we're going to lay those in the mold, and then we're going to fill in with bark clay in between those. So each one of these, and, and as I lay these in, I want to make sure that all the leaves aren't pointing in the same direction, like they're all pointing up or they're all pointing down. So as I lay these in here, each one I'm going to do will have a little bit of a different direction in there so that it doesn't look like the leaves were all exactly the same. And I don't need to fill in everything at this point. I'm just gonna do some leaves and kind of space them out. And where I'm gonna have the hole for my little bird to get in and out of my birdhouse, 
I kind of leave that area. I don't usually do a leaf there because um, it's going to get cut out anyway. So we'll do one more leaf on this side, and then we're just going to fill in with bark pieces. And so all of these other pieces of clay, I'm going to take and press against the bark texture pad to get that bark texture and lay them face down. And I want these pieces to all overlap each other a little bit. And I want to fill in the majority of this mold. On this first side, I don't want any of the pieces sticking up above the edge of the mold. But I can leave a little bit of space around there because I'll show you when we get to the other half of the mold what we're going to do with that. If you do have some that sticks above, either push it down or tear it away. Where the hole is in the bottom of the mold, you want to leave that area open because that's where we're going to reach inside to press the two halves of the mold together. A couple more little pieces here. All right, so I've got pretty much that mold filled in. You'll see some little spaces in here and that's okay on here. Now, rather than just pressing this clay down or using slip and scoring, I'm just gonna take my finger and I'm just gonna drag where those pieces of clay overlap one another. I'm gonna take and drag my finger and just mash that clay together and attach it really well. So you don't need to score. You don't need to use slip. Um, I don't recommend adding water to the inside of these molds and getting them really wet because then the clay doesn't release as well as if you're just working with the moist clay. Now, some people are obsessed with the insides of their pieces being perfectly smooth. Um, nobody's going to see the inside of this except for the birds. And um, in a workshop one time, we were talking about this. And you don't want to have sharp edges or points sticking up. But if it's kind of uneven and rough in here a little bit, it actually is better for the birds to put their nest. Because if it's perfectly smooth in there, everything just wants to fall down to the bottom. And there's nowhere for anything to grab onto. So try not to have sharp points sticking up. Um, but again, don't do water in the mold at this point. Now, as I was doing this, the whole piece of clay in here slipped a little bit and you can see it's kind of sticking up on the side. So I can try to struggle and try to shift that back over or an easy trick if that happens, is put your hand inside, flip it over, kind of lift it up a little bit and then reposition that mold over it. It's a lot easier than trying to lift that clay out of the mold from the top. Again, don't press and do a lot of pressure on there because you don't want to lose that texture. So now we'll go to the other half of the mold and we're going to use leaves again. Position your leaf designs. No questions yet. We've got a pretty quiet group tonight or I'm just doing a really good job sharing every <laughs> <laughs> Folks were asking that what size is that gourd mold that you're using? And I was um, going to I was going to grab the link and share it. But if you want to tell everybody, and then I will. Yeah. So this. this is um, what I'll do is I'll hold up the different sizes so you can kind of see them closer up next to one another. So the the Daisy Birdhouse that I did was with this is considered the large gourd, and I don't have the measurements of them in front of me but it's a little bit bigger and wider than the one that I'm working with. This is, I think, considered the short mold. This one that we're gonna work with is considered the small board mold, this one here. And the tall mold, this one here is, um, it's called the jumbo. And so, like I said, you can buy them individually. Um, but I, I want to say that jumbo one is about 12 and a half inches tall by eight and a half inches wide. Um, I usually have a tape measure out here and I'm just looking for it. I don't see it out on the, the table. So I've got the measurements if you want me to rattle them off. For okay, you. that'd be perfect. Thanks. The large one is eight and a half high by seven wide. The one that Michael's using right now is the medium gourd, and that is the six and a half, six inches high by seven inches wide. And then the small gourd is six inches high by five inches wide. 
And you could get all three of them in a set that Michael has on his website. I'll grab the link for the medium one. And then the jumbo one, I, I'll grab that info and just share that in a sec too. And yeah, there's one that's the whole, you can get the set of all four. We just added that to the website today. Um, and I think it's on special for like one twenty nine ninety five for the whole set. Yeah, so if you go to Learn Fired Arts, everybody, learnfiredarts.com, uh, there's a bunch of specials. If you hit shop, you will see that there's all the specials from the show. And when you scroll down on that first page, you see the jumbo mold, the jumbo clay, jumbo gourd, clay puzzling mold right there. And then the next item over is the set of four for 129, which is usually 164. So that's a good deal that, that Michael's running right now. Yeah, and we offer and free I'll, shipping in the, the US yeah, 48. So great. Um, and the, me so anything the measurements of that measurements of the jumbo are 12 and a half by eight and a half wide. So it's a big one. That's the one you make your turkey with, right? That jumbo yeah, one? See, yep, I did the big turkey. And then the small turkey works with the smaller version of that same shape. Fabulous. All right, I will share all over the place that link for folks for the set of four. And then you can just go to the page, everyone look around and don't do what I do. Don't order immediately. Cause see what happens is I order one thing. And then later in Michael's tutorial, I have to go back and order another thing. And then I realize there's something else. So by the time I'm done, I'll have ordered three separate orders in one night. <laughs> and you're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can't hold my horses. So now I've got, you know, this one filled in, but you can see I went above the, the edges of this one. And I'll kind of explain once I get this and show you guys how we do this then to put the two halves together. So I'm going to mash the clay where all those pieces overlap. Again, not pressing too hard. I don't want to lose my texture. I'm going to smooth it a little bit so I don't have sharp points on the inside. All right. And the clay is sticking up all around except on the top here. I'm going to add a little bit of clay up toward the top. Again, I'm leaving the hole in the bottom open where that clay goes over it. I'm just going to kind of rip that away. I'm going to do kind of a narrow strip up around the top here. And the reason I'm having this extra clay is so that when I put the two mold halves together, I've got something to attach the one side to the other. But if I put that mold on top of this, this clay is going to get caught between. So I need to really bend the clay that's sticking up in. And the reason I only do this on the one half of the mold, if I did this on both halves, all of those areas that stick up would just bang into each other. So I want to make sure this is bent in far enough that when I put that mold together, this clay won't get caught between the two. And that's why you don't have to have every single space filled in. Some people want to fill in right to the edge and they want to trim this off and have a perfect line there. The, the cool thing about these textures is where all of these pieces of clay meet, you've got that texture. And so if you do a perfectly straight line of where the one mold ends, and the other one starts, you're going to have kind of a perfectly straight line there. And it's going to be really noticeable where that seam was. Now, as I flip this over, sometimes this clay wants to pop out of the mold. So I'll wrap my fingers around it. So as I turn this over and set it on top of the other mold, then once I've got it positioned, I just slide my fingers out and take the Velcro strap, wrap it around the mold, and I usually hold the one end and I bring the strap around and then I kind of slide my finger out as I pull that over so that that's nice and tight. These molds, you can't really get your fingers inside. So we're gonna use the press tool. I get a lot of people forget to order this press tool when they order the molds. Um, this has a, a hard wood ball on one end and a bigger um, foam ball on the other end. And then there's an optional flashlight that comes with it. So that light can shine down into the inside as we go in here and you can see the, the ball down inside here. And I'm just gonna take that and I'm gonna drag 
And it's almost like I did with my finger. I'm just taking and squishing those pieces of clay from the one side to the other to attach. Again, I'm not pressing super duper hard. I don't want to lose all my texture. So I'm just kind of dragging like I did with my finger. And sometimes it's hard to see right under this part of the mold. So a lot of times I just take a finger and I put that inside there and make sure that I've got that clay squished over in that area. And then I can take the Velcro strap off, kind of wiggle the mold a little bit, and I've got my, my shape. And so all the areas where that clay meets up is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And that's where the term puzzling originally came from. Um, on this small gourd, I can take this out right away. On the larger and the jumbo gourds, I would a lot of times leave them sitting in half the mold for a little while. I might put them in front of a fan so that the fan blows on the bottom and firms up the bottom a little bit. Um, but on the smaller one, I can take it out right away. Sometimes the, the rubber leaves will fall out on their own. And you can see that rose leaf impression there. Um, or you can kind of pick them out or use a needle tool if you need to. Usually these come out pretty easily. Something I didn't mention as I was pressing the clay in here to watch for is the reason you want clay around the leaf is so that you don't get clay going over the top of the leaf. This one, there's just a little bit that went over the top of it and I can easily pull that leaf out, but you wanna make sure that you don't have a leaf that gets buried under a whole bunch of clay in here. So pull these leaves out. And then to take it out of the mold, I just take it like this, flip it over in my hand and take off the other side of the mold. And I can remove the leaves from here. And if you get some that are a little harder to grab, just use a needle tool to pop up the end and pull those out. One of the biggest mistakes that people make in this technique of, of using the leaves is they put the leaves in the clay so that the texture side is, is showing upward. And when you pull these off, you won't have any of the veining in the leaves. So it's really important that you're always pressing the side that has the texture into the clay and then laying it inside the mold. And, and in pretty much every workshop that I do, um, even though I you know, tell people and remind people to um, do that, somebody will open their mold and they will have a leaf that doesn't have um, any veining in it. And it's not a big deal because you can just take that leaf and you can put it back into that spot. And usually just kind of rubbing your finger over it gently will, will press and put that veining into the leaf. So it's not the end of the world. If you get a little bit of clay that kind of got caught between the mold, you can usually just kind of rip that off, use a needle tool or a, a um, rib to remove that. But you can see like here is where my seam line was. And it's not real noticeable because you've got all of that texture all around on that piece. Now, obviously you need a bottom for your, your birdhouse. So where there's a little bit of extra clay here, I can either cut that away or I can bend that inside. I'm gonna cut it away because we're gonna make a little plate that's gonna go over the bottom of this. And I don't want sharp edges on here that when I go to clean out this birdhouse, I've got sharp bisque that's kind of cutting me. I'm going to just set this down here for a minute. I'm going to grab a piece of clay and I will take a piece of clay that's bigger than the hole that's in the bottom. I'll flatten it out to about the same thickness of just under a half an inch to put this on the bottom and cover that hole. And I want it to be large enough that it goes around because we're going to poke holes in this so that we can wire this or tie this to the bottom and it'll be something and I like to use wire because then I can just take this off to clean out the birdhouse each spring um, and get it ready for a new bird family and so I'm going to take and press this piece of clay onto the bark texture and then I will take and put that over the bottom and kind of round it to the shape of the piece. I'm not scoring, I'm not slipping, and I'm not attaching this. I just wanna have that piece of clay to cover the hole in the bottom. 
And then you can use something to, to cut holes in it. I've got these hole punches and cutters. And the reason, you know, my, my hole is about this big, my clay slab is this big, I'm going to take and put and cut four holes in here. These holes will serve for wiring this. And it will also serve for draining if water were to happen to get inside here. So I'm going to do four holes where I can string that up. And then I'm going to do one more hole right in the middle so that if water does get in there, the water can get out. This plate will be removed later. It's not, like I said, I'm not scoring it and I'm not slipping it, but I want it to fit to the bottom so that it covers that. And then I'll just kind of take this and I kind of hold it and wiggle it a little bit to make sure that it sits kind of flat. I don't want to push down too hard because I don't want my piece to, to burst out or collapse. Then I'll decide where I want to have my hole. And so I'll take a look around on here and look for a spot that would be good for the opening. This isn't good because there's a big leaf impression there. So I think this was the area that I had kind of left. And you can use a scalpel or a needle tool or one of these big hole punches to do your hole. Now the size hole that you do, you wanna do a little bit of research on what type of birds you have and how big of an opening. Um, you don't wanna have little finch birds with a gigantic opening in it that some other bird could get inside um, if they do have eggs and things in there. So um, the opening in there, decide what type of birds you're gonna have and um, make the hole appropriate for that. We're gonna do another hole below that with a smaller punch. And this is gonna be for um, our little pedestal that's gonna come out on here. And we're just gonna do that with a little piece of clay and kind of rolling a, a tapered coil so that it's more pointed at the one end so that I can take that and I can work that into that hole that's in there. I can add some texture to this to make it kind of like a um, tree branch just using a scoring tool. If you don't have this Zem tool, the, the scoring tool, this retractable one, these are great because you don't poke yourself with it because that retracts inside. We've got those on sale too. And then I'm gonna use a little bit of slip. So I took some of this clay, let it dry out, added it to water. I do also like to, to add to, to mine. Everybody's got different things that they like to use, but this easy do mender helper, I like to add that to my slip. It makes it so that the pieces adhere better when I add them on. And when we do the leaves, that's gonna be really important. But I put a little bit of that in there and then I insert that into the hole and I can give it a little twist to make it kind of gnarly so that it's not perfectly straight. And I've got my little perch that's coming out. I can then on um, both of these, I did a little leaf over the top of the opening, kind of like a little roof that hangs out over the top of that. That's optional, um, but you can take a piece of clay and if you wanna make leaves, you can take any of the, the leaf forms. I'm gonna take one of the dahlia leaves here. Again, flatten out a piece of clay that's just under a half an inch thick, press your leaf into it so that it's flush with the clay. And then instead of taking a knife and cutting away, I just pull the clay up along the edge and rip it away. It's a lot faster this way. And then I don't like the leaf to be so thick and clunky. So then I just take my thumb and I bevel this edge so that it's thin on the edge, but it's thicker in the middle. And that serves two purposes. It makes your leaves more durable because they're thicker rather than being so thin. And it also makes it really easy to be able to peel them away from the leaf form. If you go super, super thin with your entire leaf, it will rip and tear as you try to pull that off of the leaf form. So I'm gonna score a little bit on this edge. I'm gonna add a little bit of slip. And I'm going to press this gently. And sometimes I'll reach my finger inside the hole to add a little support on the inside as I kind of press and attach that leaf. And then I've got my little leaf roof over the top of my opening. Now on the top of this piece, um, we can make some leaves that will hang down over the top. I'm using, this is one of the mum leaves. I'm gonna make these leaves the same way that 
I just made the little leaf for the roof. And so this one has a lot more indentations where the dahlia was a little bit more just a smoother edge. Same thing with this. I'm going to rip away that excess clay. And so I'm kind of pulling up from the bottom as I peel that away. And then I will bevel my edges. And then in ones that have a lot of indentations along the edge, I may have to go back and use a tool or a lot of times I can just take my finger and pull up from the bottom and pull away that clay that's in those deeper indentations. I'm not worried about the bottom of the leaf because that's where I'm gonna peel it away. Um, if I have a hard time getting in there with my finger, sometimes I will use a wooden tool to kind of go and pull up from the bottom to remove some of that clay. I generally don't bevel the clay as much at the very stem because if it's real thin there, it's harder to get it started peeling away. But by leaving it a little bit thicker, I can get a leaf. And so I'll make a, a few different leaves here to go over the top. I'm gonna do the oak leaf. This one is, I love the oak leaves, but this one has a lot of cutout areas. And this is one where a lot of times I find myself using a tool. So I'll show you guys with that one how to do that. All of the leaves, with the exception of the original maple leaves, work good for making dimensional leaves like this. The original maple leaves have really deep indentations in here. And when you start pulling that clay away, these areas are so thin that these leaves really get fragile and these ends get a little top heavy and kind of want to break off. So these are great for making impressions. I used the the maple on this leaf here. They're wonderful for impressions because they've got great detail on them. But the new maple leaf, this is a, a, a newer maple leaf that we came out with. We called it the Wisconsin green maple. The indentations aren't as deep on it. It's a little bit different style of maple leaf. So um, those are, I'll show you side by side here. Whoops, get it in the camera. This is the new Wisconsin green maple. This is the original, and there's three different sizes in the original and four sizes in the, the newer one. So I'm going to bevel the edge on this. And then this is where, because this one has some of these really deep indentations, this is where I will bring this tool and I will pull it up from the bottom to get that clay out of those deep, sharper crevices in there. And I can peel it away and I've got my oak leaf. Now you can do this using real leaves as well. Um, I live in Wisconsin. Um, I can't always go out and pick nice fresh leaves in the middle of the winter. So I'm kind of at the mercy of using these rubber leaf forms. And it also gives me consistency um, with the leaves. And it's, they, they leave sometimes a little bit better impressions than real leaves do. And you don't have to worry about them ripping and tearing as you try to pull the leaves out of the clay. Sometimes the leaves, real leaves want to rip and then you're picking little pieces of the leaf out or you're firing it and burning those little pieces out. All right, so I think this will be the last leaf that we'll make for the top of this one. This is one of, this is the dogwood. And I really like these dogwood. They've got great detail and there's four different sizes of those. So now our leaves on the top, I'm gonna score and slip. And there's usually enough texture in that bark texture on this piece. So I'm not too concerned about um, scoring the actual birdhouse itself. And you want to kind of bend these and give them a little flair and a little character. Um, I'm saving this oak leaf for last because that one can kind of go across the top and kind of finish off the top on here. We can also do a stem. I'll show you doing a stem on here and some little vines. All right, now we've got our leaves added around the top. Now, if I want to do a stem, I'm going to take one of my hole cutters and I'm going to take and I'm going to drill a hole 
right in the top of this. And I can take and create a clay coil. Um, sometimes people will put holes going through the sides and they'll put a rope through there or some type of wire and that works as well. Um, I do like to, if I put a hole in the top, that's an opportunity for water to get in there. So I wanna make sure if I have a hole in the top that I fill this in so that water can't get inside. So I can create a coil and then I can pinch this together because we want these to be able to hang. And so I will taper this together. I can go through and I can score this or use a tool to kind of rough this up and give it some texture like a branch or a vine. And then I've tapered this end so that I can stick that down inside. I can add some slip on here. I can put this inside and really work that and attach that on the inside. If I wanna add a few vines, I can roll out some coils and I taper one end so that it gets narrower and then gets a little bit wider. And then I can slip the ends of this and I can decide where I want one of these coming out and I kind of press it in, give it a little twist as I add it down. Then I will go back and I will add a little bit of slip underneath where that coil touches. I'll just do a little dab here and a little dab here. So I can add, usually I'll try to add an odd number of coils. So probably there's probably room to do about three of them on here. They don't all have to be as long. They can be a little bit shorter. I'm gonna tuck this one up underneath. Give it a twist, bring it down and add a little slip. One more. Some people really like to add these little vines coming down. Um, sometimes it makes the piece a little more fragile. If you're working with stoneware, this is a good idea, either mid-range or high fire stoneware. If you're working with earthenware, eh, people tend to pick these up and they can easily break those off. Whoops. I, I have my... a tendril like problem. I need interventions whenever <laughs> I do these because I get way carry away. <laughs> they just carry yep. And I love them. adding them. I think they, they add a lot. They look great, but I see a lot of times, even sometimes when I'm going to load them in the kiln, I forget and I pick it up and I snap one off and I'm like, oh crap. So a lot of times I will make a few extras and just have them ready so that when I break one off, I can cut away the rest of it and have another one to insert and attach in there. So this guy, is done. I'm just going to flip the camera up so you can see it more straight on. We've got our little leaf impressions all around on here. And then we're going to set that aside to dry. And that little plate, I leave that on the bottom as it dries. And um, I don't glaze that and attach that, you know, in the glaze firing or anything, I leave that separate so that I can wire that together later. Set this mold out of the way. All right, I'm gonna show you next the daisy technique. And so this, the, you know, the daisy roller is one of Jessica and Kevin's rollers. And we're gonna work inside the smaller mold. And I'm gonna take and, um, get some flattened pieces of clay, and I'm gonna set them out on my work surface, get rid of all my other mess here. And I'm gonna take the rolling pin, and so you can do any of the designs, but when I saw this daisy one, I was like, I can do stuff with that. I was like, I love that design. I love a lot of the rolling pins, but this one, because like I've got the tree one, and I really like the tree one for certain things, but this, it doesn't matter how you put these daisies in there, 
because they can go in any direction. And that's one of the things that I really love about it. So I take my flattened pieces of clay and instead of pressing it against the bark texture pad, I just roll the rolling pin over the top of it. Now I tried originally when I started playing around with this, I'm like, oh, I'll just fill my whole foam pad here with pieces of clay and I'll just roll over it once. Well, what ended up happening was pieces of clay got started to wrap around the rolling pin and um, it, it became a little bit of a hassle. So you may think it's kind of tedious to do one piece at a time, but it really does go pretty easy if you flatten a bunch of pieces of clay and just run a section of the rolling pin over. See, sometimes it'll stick like that, not a big deal, it'll peel off. But when I tried to do a whole sheet of them, half of them were sticking and rolling up with the rolling pin. And then as I came around, they were sticking to another one. And I try to use different areas of the rolling pin. It's a repetitive design over there, but I don't want every one of these pieces of clay to have the exact same flower design because there are little ones tucked in here and there. So try to get a good variety of the design. And you'll have some pieces that'll be a little bit bigger. Some pieces will be a little bit smaller. Let's get some of those little ones here. All right, and then it's just gonna be the same idea. I'm gonna set these inside the mold. I'm gonna overlap these pieces slightly. And on the one side of the mold, I'm gonna move these up because I got a big piece here. On the one side of the mold, I'm gonna go up to the seam line. And on the other half, I'm gonna go past the seam line. When I get into the neck of this piece, I'll usually take the clay and I'll kind of bend it to kind of follow that contour before I put it in there. Because if you set it across there flat and you start pushing, a lot of times it'll rip the clay where it catches on the edge or um, it will, you'll lose your design because you got to press so hard. This is a little bit bigger than it needs to be for that area. So I'm going to take my needle to it and I'm just going to trim some of this away. And I can cut some more of that away when I'm ready to um, put the mold together. All right, and I'm gonna just take my finger and drag it and mash that clay together without pressing too hard that I lose my design. We'll do the same thing to the other side. The side is going to stick up a little bit. And it never fails and never make enough. Either I make, I don't make enough pieces or I make so many that I have a dozen pieces left over. Mash these together. And then we're going to take and we're going to fold the sides of this in, just like we did on the bark and leaf one. This one, this was that first side that I did and the clay is sticking up a little bit. So I'm just gonna take the needle tool along the edge here and just cut a little bit of that away. Most of the top of this is gonna be covered with the leaves. So it's really not that big of a deal if that top area is filled in really well. 
Sometimes on the top, you'll get a little bit of that clay caught between and it might ooze out. But like I said, that'll be covered with leaves. We'll go inside with the press tool. Put a little bit of extra clay here on the bottom that'll move. Now I just noticed there's a little spot in here where I didn't have enough clay sticking up. See if I can get it in the, the camera. It's probably gonna be, uh, I can see if I turn it right here. Okay, that little spot right there where there isn't clay. And every once in a while, I will have that happen. Because it's a small enough area, I'm not worried about having flower design on it, um, but I can take a little piece of clay and I can kind of stick it to the end of the stick and I can reach inside, turn my light on here again, and I can get that positioned over that hole and then drag the tool across. And then we'll open the mold up. And we've got or daisy design all over. Again, this one is small enough that I can flip it out of the mold. Now on the top here where the clay did get caught in between, I can just take the needle tool along there and remove that clay at the top. The leaves will cover most of that. Set this down, make my plate for the bottom. And again, this plate on the bottom, I don't want it to be perfectly round. I want to make sure that it's bigger than the opening. And I will do some of the texture on that piece as well. Oops, press a little harder. And then kind of form that around the bottom. Figure out where your hole will be for your little birdhouse. Right here looks like a good spot. Now, if I need to make the hole bigger, I can either use this tool, and I'm not gonna make it bigger, but I can use this to actually cut and make it larger, or I could just use a needle tool or a scalpel to go around and cut that hole bigger in there. But for this size birdhouse, this will be perfect. Make my hole for my little perch. And basically the rest of this is identical to making the leaves for the top. So I made a bunch of the daisy leaves for the top of this one. And I can take and I can score and slip those on as well. leaves coming around the, the top and I can flare some of those out a little bit if I want. I can add some little tendrils. I can add um, a loop on the top. If I want to add a little roof leaf, I can do that as well. So same, same finishing on that. Again, then I'm going to poke the holes in the bottom to be able to wire this together and then do my one extra hole in the middle so that I have a drain if we do get some water that gets inside there. And that's it. And then these are gonna you know, dry again. And people always ask like, well, how long should I let it dry? 
it really depends on your, your conditions there. If it's really humid, it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, I usually let pieces dry for a week and then I will um, set them on top of a kiln as it fires to heat them up. And then I will often do a soaking on there at the beginning of the firing as well to um, make sure that all the moisture is out of there before I fire the pieces. So um, don't rush. A lot of times I know we're dying to get stuff done, but that really can make it challenging um, and you get pieces blowing up. So finishing the leaves, I did, this is one of the owls and I don't have the owl that was made with the gourd, but the gourds make great owls um, doing kind of the same technique with it. But I wanted to show you guys the leaves. So the leaves you can do in fall colors. And I did a video on this and I shared it with Clay Share. I'll share it again on my page that shows the painting method on here if you want to do the fall colors if you watch that video and you see it with the fall colors you can do the exact same thing with greens and yellows different shades of greens and yellows instead of fall colors on there um, the bark on the birdhouse this was a live that i did for clay share recognize that rolling pin with the birch trees on there i love that design too but this is the bark and so i did in this live, I talked about the painting technique on this. It's a black wash over the top of it with a black glaze. And then I use like stroke and coat on here or any types of colors. I use some of the color concentrates on here as well. So um, really easy to finish these. I think that bark texture, one of my favorite things to do with that is um, glazes that will break on the edges where you'll get on the sharper, higher points, you'll get like a gold and then it's a blue where you get that breaking on there. Those glazes are great on that bark texture. So I may do that on that bird, on that bird house um, with the leaves and, and do a glaze like that on the bark instead of the stroke and coat like I did on that one. All right, any other questions? We've got a couple questions. Yeah, do you glaze the inside of your bird houses? That is a really good question and that has been a debate. Some people want to glaze the inside of the bird house because they think that it will be easier to clean it out. Um, but honestly, most people feel leaving the inside of the birdhouse not glazed because otherwise it is just too slippery on the inside. So I usually leave it as bisque in there so that it's not real slippery. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. When you think about birds make houses and all kinds of things naturally, like wood, that's, that's porous. So clay not being glazed is really not an issue. Like we think about for foodware. Um, right. Another question is, is it okay to raccoon the bird houses? If someone do a raccoon fired bird house. Ooh, that would be cool. That would be very cool. Yeah, the, the only thing, you know, with raccoon, if you put it outside and it's in the sun, sometimes you'll lose the colors on there. Um, I know some of the epoxies and stuff will help with that, but that is a risk of putting raccoon outside in, in the sun. But if it's a nice shaded area in a tree, go for it. I think it'd be really cool in raccoon. The only thing I would be concerned about with Raku is because it's not waterproof and it's still porous. If it rains on the top of the birdhouse, if the clay is porous, moisture could seep down in. Whereas if it's made of either low fire or mid range clay, it's glazed on the outside. That's really going to keep most of the moisture from seeping in a little more. Yeah, that's, again, a, that's a good point. Birds, and I know birds live I get in a lot wood, of times people, porous. yeah, a lot of times people yeah. will talk about Raku and they, you know, they want to make it so a vase will hold water. And I'm like, you know, you can do like a Thompson's water seal over it and that will go into all the cracks and the crazing and stuff in it. But just like a deck, you got to reseal it every once in a while. So, you know, that would be if you really want to raccoon it, but that's that's a good point, Jessica. That might be kind of risky to, to raccoon a birdhouse. Yeah. All right. So I think we got a lot of questions. We, we have to do a giveaway. I'm going to have a winner here in a second. Um, let's see, I got another question. Is there ever a problem of the with the inside becoming too hot for the birds, even under a tree? Um, I don't, you know, I don't know that ceramic versus wood. Um, so I just keep it out of direct sunlight, put it in yeah. shade. That's the, always the safest bet anyways. Put it in an area that's shady. Don't put it in an area that gets sun because if it is going to get hot, you know, the sun's going to make it hotter, but in the shade, it should be fine. Yeah. If you live in the desert, maybe you don't want to make birdhouses 
out of clay if it's super sunny. I don't know. These are things to think about depending on where you live. But if you don't want to make a functional one, they are so cute. You make it for a decorative one in your home. You can hang it in your home or um, sit on a shelf or something. So there's lots of lots of options. Or get a little fan, put an opening in the back with a little battery operated. <laughs> a little fan. air conditioning. A little for the air bird conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Michael, thank you so much. We're going to do the giveaway um, now that you so generously sponsored. And uh, thanks so much for being here with us all month long. All these great tutorials that we've had all of November. Now we had the one tonight, but there was three others. So check those out after this broadcast. So thanks, Michael. All right. Thank you. Guys. So. We're going to give away a $100 gift certificate to LearnFiredArts.com. To enter all of our giveaways, you just go to ClayShare.com and sign up for our email list. Premium members, you are automatically always entered in all of our giveaways. Now, we do have premium member only giveaways often, so this one's open to everybody, but um, the one I'm doing next for the mini rollers is only for premium members. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to do that every week until we get to Christmas because... It's the holiday season. Why not? All right. So tonight, the winner of the $100 Learn Fired Arts gift certificate is Marilyn Livingston. Congratulations, Marilyn Livingston. You have won yourself $100 to spend at Learn Fired Arts. We will connect you with Michael, and you guys can get that all squared away um, with that. All right. Uh, again, I just want to give a little reminder that the veteran and the veteran caregiver scholarship for the lifetime premium membership for ClayShare, that is closing the end of this month. So you'll get a few more days. Please fill that out if you're a veteran or you know of a veteran or a veteran caregiver that deserves this scholarship. Um, and we are having the sale through Sunday. It's the Cyber Week sale on Membership Save 25. That's 25% off your first three months of ClayShare premium membership. Uh, what else do we got? Oh, I wanted to do a little reminder. You know, as Michael was working on those gourd molds, I did a tutorial last year making fairy houses, and a few people had suggested how great fairy houses would be out of the gourd molds. Now, my tutorial didn't use the gourd molds, but that's absolutely right. I'm sure Michael probably has already done a fairy house gourd mold tutorial, but how fun would that be? So you can check out the fairy house tutorial I did um, and see how you could change that up by using the gourd mold for the body of it. And if you want a, a more traditional birdhouse tutorial, I have one of those with templates and everything where you slabs, stiff slabs to build a birdhouse on ClayShare. So there's, if you like this, what you saw tonight, check those out because I think you're going to love that too. All right, everyone, thank you for being here with us on ClayShare Live. We'll be back next Wednesday night at 5 p.m. for live. In just a little bit, 6.15 p.m., I have prime time for my premium members. That's where we are going to make this super cute little chicken vase where we're going to layer some stamps over texture, and I'm going to show you a few different ways to do that. And also going to give away the mini rollers that we have in addition to our 12 and 7 inch. We have these little 3 and a half inch guys, which are brand new. Currently, only premium members can get them, so they're kind of an exclusive, and I'm excited to give one away. All right, everyone. Take care, be well, and I'll see y'all later.